Frank, I'm on okay. it. Switching the camera here. Have him oriented sideways. It's, it's oriented sideways on the phone, so tilt your camera. Tell uh, you want my phone oriented the other way? Yeah. Like this. Yep, there you go. Perfect, buddy. Right. Hey, there you go. Center up the fly with the center of the camera. Yeah, my, my tripod set up for it to be horizontal. So let me um I can I can make a change here. Hey, you're fine, dude. Why don't you do the tripod the other way? Take on the back of the phone. Getting set up here, ironing out some details. All right. We'll give people a couple minutes here to get started before we really get rolling. Um, we're going to do three patterns today. Um, they're all going to be made by nymphs, uh, tied on jig style hooks. Um, I'll go through each pattern's uh, recipe. Um, as we get there. And then I'll also try and show you a completed version of each fly, like before I actually go ahead and start tying. So, um, like I said, let's we'll give it. Um, if you want to get ready, if you're tying along with us, go ahead and put on a um, any size 12 nymph hook. Um, I'm going to be tying a jig style with the slotted tungsten bead. 3.3 um, millimeter in gold is what we're going to start with. So you can get that ready a while if you're if you want to. And then, uh, like I said, just a minute or two. Let's go ahead, we'll zoom in on this pattern first before we get started. Let's get this light on a little better. All right, squared away as we go. Um, and just type that in the chat and um, do you post it if any questions or anything. Um, so our first pattern here, um, this is my uh, V-Rib Mayfly Nymph. Um, this is a pattern that I came up with um, really specifically uh, for a trip to Penn's Creek a couple years ago. I wanted to come something that imitated a lot of the larger mayflies that you see up there. Um, it's been just a great pattern. I, I love fishing it in the pocket water up there. Um, you can get it down deep pretty quick. Um, all these patterns today are going to be very simple. Um, if you're a beginner tire, they should be pretty easy uh, skill-wise. It doesn't require a lot of skills. Um, but at the same time, if, if you're an advanced tire, they're, they're super effective and, and you can crank them out quite fast once you kind of get the rhythm of them and, and get rolling. So Let's go ahead and get started with this pattern. Um, I'm going to throw the, the fresh fly on. So like I said, I'm using an um, Umpqua um, number 12, uh, 450 BL uh, with a gold 3.3 millimeter slotted tungsten. Um, and we're using brown thread for this. Um, I'm going to be using material called um, V-Rib or D-Rib. Um, it is, just comes in a spool like this. Um, I don't know if you can see it here. Let's see if we can get that label on there just for people. So the size for this is the nymph size. You'll see it says NYM there at the top. Um, if you're tying this pattern in a size 12 or 14, I suggest using the nymph size. Um, if you're going to use 
this um, material for any pattern at all. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be this one and you're going a smaller size um, and maybe a 16 or an 18. I suggest going down to the midge size. That's going to be a lot, a lot better for you. So we're going to use the nymph size and olive and um, black pheasant tail for the tail. And then we're going to double collar with SLF, spiky squirrel dubbing and brown. Let's go ahead and get started with this one. First, we're just going to secure the bead. And you want to make sure not to build up too much thread in this pattern. The D rib itself is, is very bulky. And in order to keep a good profile and taper and order for it to look right and match the, the fly, you can't build up too much. So make sure you don't add too much of that thread there on your base. Keep it very thin. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is take uh, black pheasant tail fibers. Um, you can keep these pretty long. I'm just gonna pluck three or four here. Doesn't really matter just to get that impression of a tail. Um, real good way to tie these in. You can tie them in a little long. Notice I'm gonna leave these quite long and I'm gonna pull them to the length that I want. Um, you know, this fly for me, um, I like to fish it on Penn's Creek where there's a ton of large bay flies. So if you leave these tails pretty long, I don't think that's a bad thing for this one. It doesn't have to be um, a, a perfect uh, scale there like you might try for some smaller ones. So I'm going to put two light wraps in and then I'm just going to pull this pheasant tail to the length that I want. And maybe for me today, we're just going to keep it at maybe about the length of the the hook itself, so right about there. Leave them a little long, leave them a little short. It, it's not too big of a deal. And I'm just gonna secure these in, wrapping towards the bead, some hard wraps. And that's all we need. Just cover them up in the back there, keeping our body pretty slim. And that's good. So right there, so notice I left a pretty long tail um and kept the body as slim as we could so with these pheasant tail fibers you can cut them with the scissor but but they're quite brittle you need to you don't need to cut those um uh, I, pheasant tail is a great material um one of the downsides to it is it's not very durable um and as you can see there once it's kind of secured you can pluck it um we'll do a fly later with some coke de leon which is much more sturdy that you can't quite do that through. so So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off a, a piece of this uh, V-rib. Um, if you're tying many flies at once, uh, if you're going to tie multiples, um, uh, in order to save this material, I would simply cut the longest piece that you're comfortable working with. That'll help you conserve because you can cut all portions and you're um, uh, cutting a bunch of smaller sections of this. You'll waste more material because you're always going to have a little bit of waste. So if you're tying a lot of flies, I suggest using the longest piece that you can feel comfortable working with. Um, if you're going to simply tie one like we are today, you can go a little shorter, just an amount that you feel easy, you know, wrapping around and everything and ribbing with it. So I'm just going to cut this nice long piece. It's easy to work with. This vinyl ribbing is shaped like a D. And it's going to be almost impossible for you to see on the camera, but I'm going to have them flat side. If I want this fly to have a good segmented look, I'm going to have to put that flat side on the bottom closer to the fly. So I want that curved side facing up, all right? And so when I tie this in, I'm gonna tie it in the length of the hook shank, um, and that's so I keep that same profile. If I tie it in close to the tail, you'll have a weird bump on the end, and it'll kind of just mess up the profile of your fly. So what we're gonna do, make sure you feel it. Um, if your eyes aren't great, or if you don't have good lighting, um, I just put it in the light, and I, I feel where that, with my fingers, where that flat side is. You want that flat side to be facing down, and I just make sure I eyeball it, feel it, and I'm going to tie it in. And I don't want any extra here if possible. Um, what's nice about these slotted beads is that will fit right into the slot if you do it right. And even if you have a little extra, it'll kind of you can kind of smash it in there, and that gets rid of any um, excess that you're going to have on on the first part you're working in. So I'm going to tie that in nice and tight. And I'm going to wrap that back down towards the tailing material. You 
you can kind of smash it down hard. Um, I'm using um, 140 denier thread. Um, I like that because you can, you still don't build up a lot of ball rate size of thread to use with nymphs. If you're using 70, sometimes if you put a lot of pressure, you'll, you'll snap your thread. And if you're using 210, it'll often, it'll often uh, build up too much ball too quickly. I get it right back down to that tail. I don't want it to go bend or else when I wrap this, it's going to push my pheasant tip around too much. Um, and I'm just going to work that, tie that back up to the um, bead. And I'm going to wrap this the opposite way that I'm wrapping my thread. So if I'm wrapping my thread forward, I'm going to take this ribbon material and I'm going to counter wrap it the opposite direction. So we're going to go underneath here. And you should notice a good segmented look. If it looks real flat after about three, maybe four wraps, that means you put the flat side up and it won't give it that nice look. It'll still fish pretty well, um, but I really like that segmented look that this V-rib gives when you get that curve side going up. And we wrap it the whole way up so you can't anymore. I'm gonna hold the V-rib straight down at this point. I'm kind of keeping it in place with my left hand and then with my with my tying hand, my thread hand, I'm gonna come and give a hard wrap. And I really wanna get that down close to the bead. And where I want this excess to sit is right on the slot of the tungsten bead. If I can get that, any excess will once again kind of fall into that slot and it gives it a much cleaner finish. So I don't wanna to give too many wraps here because we're still gonna add some dubbing. So I'm going to do three good hard wraps or maybe four, whatever you feel comfortable. And this is what we should have here. All right. One of the, uh, one thing to talk about here before we go on the, the finishing this off with the dubbing. Um, this V rib is vinyl. Ring. Um, it's pretty translucent. So whatever color thread you choose to put underneath of this, um, is going to give you a different look. Um, I like to tie this with um, a small pad with this material with chartreuse thread underneath. It really brightens up. Um, you could try any color combination. You could even um, experiment with putting some flash, like some uh, flashy tinsel underneath the V-rib as well, and it'll give it a flashier look. Um, I'm going for a pretty natural um, nymph color here, and that's what we're looking for now. All right, so um, experiment with colors. Um, both the color of the ribbing and also the color of the thread and any combination of those is going to create different looks. So I've experimented with everything from purple to pink to clear, um, black, all sorts of threads. Um, and I've kind of, kind of come to find that the olive and the browns are my favorite. And then you can brighten up the look of it um, depending on whether you're going to use a, a lighter or a dark thread. All right. So I'm going to get this secured. Um, which I have, and I'm just gonna take my scissors and cut it off as close as we can. And there we are with that. Um, for the dubbing, um, all the dubbing we're gonna to use today is gonna to be different colors of SLF spiky squirrel dubbing. You can see that label. This isn't the color I'm using, but that's the label. This is great stuff. It's a squirrel dubbing blend. Um, it has a lot of guard hairs, which are those coarse long fibers that you're gonna see. Um, it's really good for um, tying waltz worms and tons of other patterns. And I just think it has a good buggy look. Uh, it's pretty much my go-to dubbing with nymphs and it, it's a pretty natural looking dubbing. Um, another thing you can do if you want to flash your dubbing, uh, you could certainly replace this with an ice dub. Um, I think a peacock ice dub would look really good on this. Uh, I like to use SLF Prism if I'm using like a flash your dubbing. Uh, the chocolate brown and Prism is another great color that you could add here if you want to give it a little bit more flash. Um, I like to keep this one natural myself. So that's what I'll do. And I'm just going to take a pinch of it. Uh, you don't have to get too, don't, don't go too much here uh, with your dubbing. It's, it's pretty easy to put too much dubbing on, but essentially um, you have two options here. Um, you can keep this quite thin if you want this fly to kind of be uh, streamlined, sink really fast, or if you want it to get in this taper, you can kind of wrap the dubbing a little looser. Um, I like to give it a buggy look on this particular pattern, so I'm just going to dub it pretty loosely here. Um, very similar to how you might finish off a ton of other nymphs here, so I'm just going to wrap it around. And 
thin. I'm gonna take a little bit off there. Don't want it too thick, but I also want it to have a nice taper. And if you wanted to, you could you could pick that out with the dubbing brush. I don't I don't really worry about that stuff. Um, whatever natural bugginess you get with it um, is kind of what I go with. And a little touch more there. And that's that. So all I'm going to do now is, is whip finish it um, and I'm done and you can cut off any ridiculous amount of excess, but don't, don't shave it down too much. Leave it. You want those guard hairs to stick out. You want some of that fuzz to stick out a little bit. You won't want it to get crazy, but um, you know, a little bit is good. So here I'm going to whip finish. Um, I like to use the tool. Some people use their fingers. There's a couple options here, but I'm using the traditional uh, whip finishing tool. And so if you don't know how to use that, let's just go over that. So I'm going to take the, keep my thread down. I'm going to have my hook and I'm going to put the hook right over top of my thread. I'm going to take my thread around in front or behind from my angle in front for your angle around the other hump there and make a figure four. All right. So to you, it might look like a backwards four. To me, it looks like it's four. It looks like a forward four. I'm going to put the bead and the eye of the hook through the triangle that I've created. One, two, three wraps, pop it off the curved part, pull it tight with the bobbin and slide your hook out. And there you have it. You can do another one, another three turn whip finish. You can go faster if you can. If not, it's no big deal. And then you get that tight. And now we're done. Um, if you like to use head cement, you can you can add a dab of head cement just under just behind the bead to make sure that thread doesn't unwind. Um, I'm going to use a, a UV flow in place of head cement. Um, I love using this instead of head cement because um, I used to have issues spilling head cement. It would dry um, without me knowing. It would ruin whatever was in my drawer, or whatever is on my table or my box or whatever. Um, and I just always had issues with it, but this uh, UV clear finish from Lou, uh, the flow is the thinnest, which is what I like to use as a replacement for head cement. Um, that is my favorite for just finishing off a fly. I'm not really going to coat it or anything with this this time around. Um, it's a really good way to replace head cement. So I'm just going to flip my fly upside down, put just a touch of it right at where the thread is, right below the eye of the hook, and I'm going to hit it with my light. Make sure it sets, um, and that's it. So that's the V-Rib Mayfly Nymph. Um, like I said, I love using this pattern on Penn Street. Um, it's great for any stream that has larger mayflies or even, even stoneflies. Um, it's just a good all around, you know, buggy looking nymph, and it's very simple to tie. You know, to anywhere that I want to fish this fly, I'm going to try and get a dozen of these cranked out, and it's not, it's not too hard. So. If anybody has any questions on that, feel free to comment here in the chat as we get ready for our next fly pattern. All right, so pop this guy off of here. So right across most of the state, it is uh, it's sulfur season. Uh, there are solvers hatching uh, most of Pennsylvania's streams, uh, most of our trout streams, um, and sulfur nymphs. Um, you know, there's a a lot of people who who love to tie up sulfur nymphs for this time of year. Um, I'm a believer that you know a, a standard old pheasant tail or even a waltz worm is as good of sulfur nymph imitation um, as anything, and I don't think that. The color is, is often overplayed a little bit in my opinion, but um, I think a lot of people, despite despite that being my opinion, I think a lot of people have a lot of confidence when you when you tie a nymph that's specifically made for um, you know that hatch that you're that you're targeting. So trying to match that hatch is, is a good thing, and if you and if it makes you confident to fish a sulfur colored nymph during that time, that's a good thing. So um, 
this is a pattern that um, I came up with and I started fishing this year and um, I like it. Um, you can definitely alter this pattern to make it match um, whatever it is you're, you're fishing, whether that's an olive, a nymph, a brown, whatever. Um, there's, there's plenty of replacements. So um, what I'm going to do here is uh, simply uh, switch out my thread and I'm going to use um, Vivas Body Quill instead of a thread, a true thread this time. So uh, this is the Vivas Body Quill. Um, the color is on their, um, on their chart, it's called Golden. Um, and it's the color number four. If, you, if I move this here, you'll be able to see that a little better. Um, it says BQ4 on it. That's just the Vivas number that they use. So it's Body Quill number four. Um, this is great stuff. Um, it gives a nice shine to the body. Um, so it's a great replacement. If you were going to tie a thread body fly, um, it's, it's a great replacement versus just using standard old thread because it has a little bit more liveliness to it. Um, it's something that I like to incorporate um, in a couple different patterns that I tie. Um, I think uh, David Bauer tied the other night on his with the uh, his Pertagon that he tied. It's a great material for that as well. So I'm going to secure the bead in. I'm just going to go right to this um, with the body quill. So once again, this fly, I don't need to worry about bulk so much because I'm um, that tailing material is going to be um, Coke de Leon or CDL. And I'm just going to use the medium, the speckled uh, Coke de Leon comes in the separate packs. I don't ever use the whole skins that you, you can get, like the big, the big packets that are the higher quality stuff for, for nymphing tails. Um, it's just no need for all that. So I got that in eight millimeter gold bead again. Um, I think um, you have a lot of potential to add a lot of variety to a sulfur nymph. Um, you know, here in the yellow breaches, we've been seeing some big sulfur nymphs, uh, size 12s. Um, you can go to the late season on the upper Delaware River, find sulfurs that are um, quite small down to like 16s. So um, you got to, you know, base this pattern off of whatever is most prevalent in your area and, and, and where you're fishing, um, and that'll work. Um, so for the tailing material, I'm using Coke de Leon. Get that a little closer here. And this stuff is awesome for tails on nymphs. Um, it is way more durable than uh, your regular pheasant tail fibers. So um, pheasant tail is quite brittle. Um, it looks great and it's easy to work with, but at the same time, it also breaks quite easily. So I'm going to use this CDL. Um, and because these fibers are so much thinner than your standard, you know, pheasant tail fibers, I'm going to tie, uh, pinch off a, a good number of them. So I'm going to find a section of the feather that I like, and I'm going to take a, a generous amount of them. And I dropped a couple. But yeah, a number of fibers, eight, nine, whatever fibers, however many you think looks good. Um, if you want that tail to be more prominent, tie on a bunch. Um, if you want it to be thin, if you're tying like a 16 or an 18, you, could, you can use fewer of them. Um, I'm on a 14 and, and that's kind of, that amount there is what, I, what I'm looking for. So once again, we can, we can work this the same way we work that pheasant tail. I can just put a loose wrap in or two get it kind of squared up one or two loose wraps and then I can kind of pull it and adjust it to the length that I want that's actually pretty close and I'm going to leave it there all right so I don't mind if I'm going to bother putting a tail on a nymph I don't I don't mind leaving them long mayfly nymphs are quite long and if, if you're putting a tail on um, it's something for the fish to see and just why not put a little more of it so I don't think it hurts to go a little long on the tail I'm just going to secure that in with the body quill I can't tie down as hard with this Vivas body quill as I could with, say, you know, my, my standard thread. Because it will break a little bit easier than a 140 denier thread. So I'm just going to tie that back right to the bend of the book. And at this point, um, you can... You're gonna have to use your scissors to cut scissors to cut off the excess because this stuff won't pull off quite as easy as the pheasant tail will. And here you have a decision to make. Um, you can put on as much of this or as little of this as you want to keep this um, as slim or as thick as you want. Um, 
like I said, there's a lot of variety in solvers uh, throughout the state in Pennsylvania and beyond. So, you know, making that uh, bulk up to the size that you need is, is key. I want to put a good bit on here. I want, I want this to have a little more thickness. I'm not trying to get super, super thin here with this pattern. Don't build a taper into it because we are going to be adding some dubbing at the end. But before that, uh, as an option, I'm going to coat it with some UV. If I do that and I add a, a too much of a taper, your thread's going to slide down because it's going to make it quite slick. So don't focus too much of your thread right at the eye. We're going to cover that up, or sorry, yeah, right at the bead. We're going to cover that up anyway. So I'm just going to build up a lot. Nice layer here. And once I put the UV coating on, it's not going to look as um, light as it is. Um, it's going to darken it up a good bit. Um, if you ever look at real sulfur nymphs, they don't have as much yellow and oranginess to them as their adult counterparts. And they have like a bronzish brown blend. Um, they have a light, they sometimes will be kind of two-toned. Um, but I like that bronzy color. And I think once you hit this with the UV coating, it kind of achieved that for us. So build up the thickness of body that you like. It, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Just try and match it to, you know, the bugs you're seeing out there. At this point, um, we're ready to do the UV coat. So I'm actually going to whip finish this um, and cut off the body quilt because we we're done with that. So I'm going to throw a couple whips in just to, to secure it and cut that off. So now we're going to coat it with some UV, um, similar to how you might with the Pertagon. Um, and I'm going to use the flow. I, I'm not looking for a really thick coating. Um, I'm just looking to add some durability to this material. Um, you certainly could leave this fly as it is, um, but it, it can fray a little bit. If you catch a lot of fish on it and their teeth hit that material, it can get cut up. Um, and it, I just like to add this UV because it adds a durability factor. If you're lucky enough to get into a lot of fish with this one fly, then you'll, you'll be happy that you added that um, slight layer of, dur of durability to it. So. I'm gonna go ahead and just put a little layer right on the top. And I'm just gonna move my vise and just get to just lightly coat around the length of that nymph. And it, it's pretty runny stuff in this in the flow. So don't need too much. And then right away, hit it with the light before it starts to puddle up on the bottom. Because if you leave it go, it will start to run. wait for that to harden. Anytime you're using UV coating, um, whether it's uh, for a Pertagon or something something similar like this is similar, um, hit it long enough and you want to touch it. It shouldn't feel tacky and it shouldn't feel wet to the touch. Um, it does, which I felt a little bit tacked to it. I'm going to hit it with the light one more time. Make sure you hit it at all the angles and getting that to set really nice and cure well. All right, from here, um, I'm going to go back to my thread, um, just back to that brown thread. Um, nothing fancy here. If you wanted to add a yellow hot spot, um, you could go to a yellow thread here just to kind of give it more of that sulfur look. Um, I, I just I just use brown, and I'm just going to start a couple wraps here right at the eye. At this point, this is what I was talking about. If you would have built up too much of a taper with your thread right there, you would have had the issue of your thread sliding down the whole body of the fly, which it almost makes it very irritating and almost impossible to finish this fly off like this. So um, I just get enough thread there right where I just want to put my dubbing and cut off my excess. And I'm going to go back to the same dubbing I used before on the other fly, actually. Um, this is going to be a brown spiky squirrel dubbing SF stuff. Like I said, this is my favorite dubbing for nymphs. Um, I think it's great stuff uh, in general. So I use it as much as possible. Like I said, though, if you don't have it or you like to use other stuff, plenty of substitutes for this kind of thing. The material isn't the most important thing for, for something like this. And like I said before, if you want this fly to, to sink fast, you could you can consider not even putting dubbing on it and leaving it like a Pertagon. Um, or if tapered you know add some dubbing and you can put it on as loose or as tight as you'd like to give it the the effect that you want 
you like that ball gear look, tie it loose. Um, I don't mess around with too many dubbing loops or anything like that. Um, I just find it's a step that I don't believe necessarily results in catching more fish per se. It makes some great looking flies, but um, I just twist it on and, and I do just, just fine with that. So just enough to add a little bit of a taper. And there we are once again. Um, we have that good mayfly taper, a little bulky at the head, getting skinny at the tail, and we're ready to tie it off. So, flip finish again. One, time, one more time, make our figure four. And I'm wrapping it through the triangle. One thing you can do here, if you run out of thread to work with, you can always pull your, give your bobbin some more slack so that you can manage this more. So, um, if you get stuck and you feel like you run out of thread to work with when you're whip finishing, you can always pull some more thread off that bobbin. And give it a couple wraps, finish her off. A couple more for good measure. Whoops, messed that up one more time. There we go. And cut that off, and you're good to go. Once again, we'll put just a touch of our UV flow right where that whip finish was. If you get a little in the eye of the hook, that's okay. You'll just have to poke that out later before you fish it. Now we're set. All right, so there we go. This one's a little thin. Let's give you a one zoom in there. So that's our finished product for my quill body sulfur nymph. Ends up with pretty bronze uh, kind of color to it, just like the, the nymphs look. Um, works really well for me this time of year. Um, quite simple to tie and pretty quick as well. So here's that one. So you'll notice these patterns are, are quite quick to tie. Um, if I'm tying nymphs, um, it's normally because I've, I've lost a lot of nymphs. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't like to put a lot of time and energy into tying a nymph pattern. Um, sometimes I find that all those details that you work on that really make a fly look great um, often don't catch you that many more fish than, than a simple pared down version of that same pattern. So uh, our first two nymphs here just had three materials. Um, and I think they're, um, you know, that just keeps it simple. And it's like I said earlier, a beginner tire could, could sit down with us and, and, and probably tie these pretty, pretty darn well tonight. And an advanced tire could crank out a lot of these in a short amount of time. Um, I think there's something to be said for that. Um, I don't consider myself a very great detailed tire. Um, I'm not tying a lot of awesome streamers like uh, some of our guys here at the shop tie some great stuff. Alex tied some great stuff last week. Um, I'm more cranking up flies for production, um, simple flies that are quick and easy to tie that work well. And that's kind of my philosophy here. So if they're going quick, um, it's just because that's just a lot of the flies I like to tie go quick. Um, so if you're going fast for anybody, let me know. It seems like no one's commenting, telling me, telling me to slow down. That's a good thing. Um, so there's that one. Um, pretty slender looking uh, sulfur nymph. And, and, and one more time, I can't stress enough. Um, you could tie these flies with all sorts of replacement materials. You can go bigger. You can go a little smaller. Um, there's a lot of variations here. Um, just uh, trying to share with you guys a few techniques that are, that are pretty productive for me. All right. So the next one we're going to go to is um, a nymph that I came up with last year um, that I've had a lot of success with. Um, and it is called the, um, this is my Wee Wool um, Mayfly Nymph. So, oh, someone's telling me to slow down here, a couple people. <laughs> we'll give you a minute to finish this one up if you're tying along. Sorry guys. At least we got at least we got someone laughing at me. That's good. <laughs> um, but like I said, um, if you're tied along um, and you're just learning these patterns, um, yeah, take your time. Even though they're they're quick and simple, um, you know, taking your time to get those proportions right and and get all your materials secured in, it always goes a long way. Um, a couple other fly ones finishing up here. Um, I like the uh, to tie this in a slightly smaller size uh, to imitate a blue olive. 
same format. You can use that CDL uh, as a tail. Um, you can also use, I happen to have it sitting right here for uh, a blue winged olive, the Vivas olive um, body quill. Um, the color is number five, I think. Yeah, olive number five. Get that a little closer. If you're tying a blue winged olive in this, you know, similar style, that's a good that's a good color substitute instead of that golden. Um, and then you can use that same brown dubbing. Um, you could use a darker, a lighter, just depending on what you're trying to go for. Thanks, Sean. So there we go. Our next one is also also going to be on a size 14 jig hook. Um, I put in the recipe online a 3.8 millimeter bead. Um, you could use a 3.3 millimeter bead. Um, just a little, I'll digress a little bit about bead sizes on, on these jig hooks. Um, I have always at the shop, we get a ton of question about what bead to put on which hook. Um, and it's not too complicated, but um, it definitely can be confusing if you're just getting started. Um, essentially, um, I kind of like to think of it, and, and, and this is just a, this is my way of doing it. You can definitely oversize beads more than this. Um, if it's a 12, I think a good medium size bead for a 12 is a 3.3 millimeter bead. If you're using the hairline um, beads, which let's see if I have all my packages, I've ripped off the label, so I don't have one to show you right now. Uh, but if you're using the hairline slotted tungsten beads, um, the 3.3 millimeter bead is like a good medium weight for an, a size 12. Um, if you want to go a little heavier, you could bump up to a 3.8 millimeter bead. Same thing, the scale kind of just steps down, down to a size 14 hook. Um, if I want to have like a nice medium weighted nymph, I'm going to use a size 2.8 millimeter bead. If I want to go a little heavy, I might use a size 3.3 millimeter bead. And that scale um, kind of follows the size patterns the whole way down. On one of my blog posts, I put a chart. Um, I think it's the first half of the fly tying tips blog that I tied for um, tying Euro nymphs. Um, I put a little chart in there, so you could go back and look at that um, if you uh, bead to use. So um, for this fly, we're going to use um, it's my wee wool nymph, um, another mayfly imitation. Um, this isn't one that I, I tied specifically for anywhere. It was something I was just experimenting with last year. Um, and I just started using it on the yellow breaches, some of our smaller wild brown trout, tr trout streams around here, and I uh, had success right away. Um, today I'm going to tie it with a 3.3 millimeter bead. I think in the recipe I had a 2.8. You can mix it up either way. Um, it doesn't really matter. And I tie it on a 14, and it works well for me. Um, it's going to use a, a couple more steps than the other ones, so I'll make sure I try and slow down here for everybody. So once again, not getting too fancy with my thread. I'm just going to go down back to a, uh, any, any sort of brown thread that you might have. I'm using a brown olive. Um, if you want a hot spot on this nymph, I think it would look good with a hot spot. You could use a pink or a fluorescent orange or a, a number of different options there for a hot spot. Um, anything will work here. Um, I like to keep it natural. Uh, the ones I chose tonight, um, I'm, I'm keeping them a little bit more natural. And so that's the explanation. I'm going to go ahead and tie my bead into place, securing it. And this one, um, and this one, um, you don't have to worry too much about building up bulk here. Um, I like this particular pattern to be quite buggy. And if it gets a little bulky somewhere, that's not the end of the world on this one. The materials I'm tying in are going to be quite thin. Just a piece of wire, some CDL for the tail, and some wee wool. So um, it's going to be pretty, pretty easy to keep the proportions good on this one because you're not tying anything too thick. All right, so I'm going to go back to my CDL, the Coke de Leon, the same stuff we used for the tailing material in our last one. And once again, um, for this one, I would pick out even more feathers than you did the last one. 
to make that tail even more prominent because it just to make it look proportional to the rest of the fly. Um, you're gonna have to make sure that you, you add a lot in. So I'm gonna find a good spot. And, you know, some of these uh, fibers, if you'll notice, um, there are different lengths. As they get close to the tip, they get shorter. And as they get close to the, to the base, they get a lot uh, longer. So try and pick a chunk that doesn't change length too much and that'll make your life a little bit easier. So I'm gonna pick a, a real healthy chunk of these longer, longer ones down here because I want it to, to stand out pretty well. right here same thing secure in a couple loose wraps take a look see if you like that tail a little longer a little shorter you can just use your fingers to kind of pull whichever way you think you need to adjust it um, I'm just gonna go a little longer there and that's gonna be fine for me a tail about that long all right secure that in and wrap the whole way down right to the curve of the hook. Any of these nymphs here, if you start tying down the bend, um, you're gonna get those tails pointing down and you're also gonna have your um, the, butt of the tail of your nymph, the, the skinny end of the taper, it's gonna start curving down. Um, that might not necessarily impact the, how well that fly fishes. Um, but if you just want to have your flies a little more consistent uh, with the amount of materials you use, it's nice to kind of have a nice stopping point. And um, for my mayflies, I like them to look straight. Um, I don't know that having them really straight is going to catch more or less fish, but it just helps me to be consistent when I'm tying um, in general. So once I get that down, cut off my excess. Remember, we can't rip this off quite as easily as pheasant tail because it's a much more stout material. And I'm going to tie in two materials here to rib with. Um, the first is wee wool. Um, this stuff is cool um, as a ribbing material for nymphs. It's going to blend in with the dubbing that I use very, very well. Um, and it's going to stand out well when it's dry, but when it gets wet, it's all going to mesh together. And I really like how that looks. Um, I'm going to use red today. Um, they make this in a multitude of different colors. If you wanted to stick to uh, the sulfurs, um, you could simply use a yellow or an orangish color. Um, if you wanted to make it like a caddis, like a green caddis, you could use a lime green or a chartreuse color. They make a, a similar color to that. Um, I tie a, um, a caddis pupa for October caddis where I use the orange in a very similar fashion. Um, it works great. Um, but the problem with this stuff is that it's very, very easy to cut. And if you catch a handful of fish with this, their teeth will shred it apart. And so we're going to reinforce it with some wire. So the first thing we're going to tie in is any dark colored wire that you might have. Um, you could use a black. You could use a, um, an olive. I'm going to use a dark sculpted olive if I can find it. And I can't even see it. Oh, here it is sitting, sneaking back here. So I'm using a sculpted olive colored wire. Like I said, the color of the wire isn't really important. And I, in fact, I want to pick a color that I think I won't see very well on this pattern because this wire is just to reinforce that, um, that wee wool. By, by wrapping that wire over the wee wool, it's going to make it a lot more durable. And so if it does get cut a little bit, there's something else holding it in place. So it'll get you a few more fish out of the same fly without having to scrap it because your fly is just falling apart on you after, after a couple fish. Um, as always with wire, make sure that you are going to cut it with some older scissors that you don't care about anymore versus your brand new super razor sharp scissors that you're going to use to trim deer hair and stuff with. Uh, don't use that. Use your, use your old scissors or, or your friend's scissors for this. So <laughs> you don't cut your scissors. So I use my older pair of scissors and I'm just going to tie this wire in. I'm going to start, I'm just going to leave enough to simply match the length of the hook. Secure that really well. One, like I said, I'm not too worried about bulk here. Obviously, I don't want to get carried away with my bulk and the CDL fibers to smash down. There we go. Uh, I'm not too worried about bulk. I don't want to get carried away, but we're tying in a couple things here. And I like this fly to look like so don't worry about bulk as, as much. So we get that in there, and then I'm going to take a piece of the wee wool, the wool yarn. 
just whatever piece is a comfortable amount to work with. This stuff will fray a little bit, so don't leave it if you are like preparing to tie a lot of flies. I don't leave it, I don't cut a bunch of small pieces up. I actually just cut one at a time because the ends will fray and that's kind of annoying. It doesn't really matter, but that just bothers me. So um, if you cut it and tie it in right away, it's not a big deal. So tie that in and I'm just gonna pull it right to the point that I can cover it all up without wasting any material. And I'm just gonna wrap that back in the whole way back to where I wrap the wire into, so. Holding it back. If you if you have a vise with these springs, um, what these springs are for, just kind of push your excess material into those. That kinds of hold kind of hold. You don't have that. You can just use your finger and with some tension hold it back like this and wrap it all the way back down, right to the bend of the hook, right there, and that's good. All right, this stuff. Um, like I said, don't pull on it too far. I, I ripped it. You can tear it pretty easily. It's not the most durable stuff, but it does look good when, when the nymph gets wet. So once I make sure I'm nice and secure there, I'm all set. I'm going to add some dubbing. Um, I'm going to use the same brand of dubbing, but I'm switching up the color. I'm using SLF Spiky Squirrel in Natural Fox. Um, this is literally, uh, I think, the best dubbing in the world for nymphs, the Natural Fox color. It looks a little bit like everything. It looks, um, it's a great waltz worm fly. I use it to make crest bugs for fishing our spring creeks around here. I use it for waltzes. I use it for mayfly nymphs. I use it for a lot of different patterns. I, it's my favorite stuff. So once again, it has a lot of um, guard hairs in it, which are those stiff, coarse fibers that will cause it to have that spiky look. But it also has a nice blend of soft fibers, so it's easy to work with. If you're going to use a dubbing that utilizes... Um, uh, I forget what it's called. It's, it's a natural dubbing with a ton of guard hairs. You might need to use some dubbing wax to make it more workable. Um, I don't find that I need dubbing wax for this at all. It's just pretty easy to work with. So get a little too much out. I'm just going to strip some of that. Um, I'm still going to try and make a taper with this. Um, so I'm going to try and get a little thinner amount of dubbing down at the butt of the fly. But like I said, if it, if it bulks up a little bit, you're going to wrap it with two ribbing materials between that weevil and that wire. It'll smash it down pretty good. So don't worry if it looks a little bit messy um, as you're first starting to dub this. In fact, if you dub this too tight, I don't think it gives you the effect. One of the things I like is that it all blends together and gives you that impression of color without it being too glaring. So somewhat loose wraps. And notice I'm already starting to build up a good amount there. I'm not worried about all that bulk. It'll sort itself out when I rib everything else. So just about to there. Pick that out if you want a little bit. Actually, don't, don't pick it out until you get rid of it if you want it to be even buggier. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the wee wool and I'm going to counter wrap it again. So I'm going to wrap it the opposite way that I did my um, dubbing. Um, and then when I do my wire, I'm going to reverse it again and do it the same way that I did my th that I did my dubbing and my thread. All right. And that's going to help it to, um, secure it in place, keep it durable and it won't blend together as much. All right. So I'm going to take this we wool and rib it in reverse and a good number of wraps would be three or four for a size 14. And I want these to clamp down pretty hard. And if you get that segmented look, you did it right, just like that, space them apart evenly. And then I'm going to tie just a couple wraps to secure that. Nothing nothing too crazy there, just to secure the wee wool. So we get that in. And it looks quite red now, but once it gets wet, and once we add our, our thorax, um, it's going to really help it blend together. So it looks like a really uh, loud fly at the moment to me, but it doesn't stay like that once we're finished with it. All right? So if you want to, you can cut that we will off. And there you have what we have now. And so I wrap the we will um, underneath. So opposite the way I wrap my thread, I'm wrapping my thread forward. I rib the wool underneath. Now I'm going to rib the wire forward. So it kind of crosses over that we will and helps really secure it into place. All right. This is going to really help it to um, 
be more durable. And if you do get your little pieces of wool cut by a, a, a toothy fish, um, it, it'll last a lot longer. So I'm just going to take this wire, and, and, and if you pick a good wire color, you shouldn't see it too terribly much. Um, you might notice it a bit, but it shouldn't be too bad. And about the same, about the same amount, I, same number of wraps that I use for that wool, about three or four, going forward, and get it to the front. And I'm just going to tie that into place. Uh, so once again, don't use your good scissors to finish this off. Better yet, if you secure your thread in, or sorry, if you secure that wire in nice and tight. You can just wiggle the wire back and forth or use a helicopter to get that wire to pop off without even using your scissors. But once, if you don't have it, your thread wrapped it in tight enough, um, it, you won't get that effect. You won't be able to do that. So in order to make sure I have a couple really good hard wraps, a good way to get a nice hard wrap in and secure material is to put a wrap in hard and maintain that same tension all the way around. And that's a nice hard wrap. So and then I'm going to take my bobbin to close to the fly. And I'm going to either wiggle it back and forth, or I'm going to spin it like a helicopter in a circle, and eventually it just pops off. And you didn't waste any wire. You can reuse this for another fly, and you didn't have to put any sort of a beating on your scissors. So now I'm going to add um, a different colored dubbing. Once again, I'm, I'm sticking to this spiky swirl stuff. Obviously, you found out by now that I like it a lot. I'm going to use the dark brown. Um, this is going to give it a really good contrast, and I want to put this in quite loose so that it um, kind of blends in and it lays over some of that color. Um, and it's just going to leave us with a little bit of red showing, um, that gray dubbing underneath that looks really natural, and some nice contrast on the dubbing that we have on the thorax. go and if you like to do a dubbing loop if you're in that stuff now will be a good time to do it because it will give that nice spiky buggy look but like i said i just prefer to just wrap it a little looser if i really want that to protrude a little bit more so i'm going to go here wrap here let it build up nice and good and there we go so that's that from here um that's the fly. We'll finish it off and we're pretty much done. Um, so I'll take my whip finish. Make our four. Three turns. Tie it off. And a couple more turns. Ooh, that's good. Tie it off. And like I said, I like to finish these flies with a little bit of UV instead of head cement your if you do your whip finishes right it'll probably hold but um i like to add a little security just a dab and hit it with the light all right and there you have it so that's my wee wool uh, mayfly nymph. Um, it just gets a, it, it doesn't to me, it looks better when it's one of those flies that looks a lot better when it's wet. Um, it has a lot of red, but that red really gets engulfed by the naturals and it sticks out ever so subtly um, when you're actually fishing it. Um, like I said, they'll experiment with some different colors of that wee wool. Um, it's sulfur season, so if they're in one like an orange or a yellow, um, a caddis green would also be not a, not a bad bet. Um, we'll go ahead and put the white background on it to get a nice shot. Do I ever tie pertigons? Um, I don't tie too many pertigons. Um, since we have a little bit of time left, I could show you a fly pattern that I like to use in place of a pertigon. Um, and it's going to go back to using that uh, V-rib that I talked about earlier, and it's actually the only material I will use. Um, to me, the advantage of a Pertigon and, and why you might want to fish one is because they are extremely durable and they sink quite fast for their size. So you don't have to use a very large bead and they're going to get down to that strike zone very quickly. Um, any sort of fly that you tie that doesn't have a lot of stuff sticking out of it, 
like limit the amount of legs, limit the amount of dubbing that you use, um, anything extra like biots or for a wing case or anything, any of those extra steps, um, eliminate them. And that's the idea with the Pergon. So um, since we have five minutes, um, I'll whip out a go too far over our hour, but since we asked about Pergons, this is the one that I like to tie in place of a Pergon. I'm gonna use a size 16 for this one. And this is just a bonus. This wasn't on the website or anything, but I figured since you asked, show you how. This is one of my most effective patterns um, and it's by far the easiest to tie fly that I know that works this well. Um, and you'll be, you might leave with a question mark saying, what's the point of that? But I'm telling you this fly, this is my favorite. So I'm gonna tie on a 16 with a 2.8 millimeter slotted tungsten bead. And give me a second here to put some chartreuse thread into my bobbin. So the reason this fly is similar to a Pertagon is because it's very fast and it's also extremely durable. I almost never have these flies fall apart. If they do, it's because I messed up tying it and didn't finish it off very well. So I'm gonna be using the chartreuse thread because it makes that, um, it shines to the beaver pretty well. I, I think of this fly as a caddis uh, pupa, but I don't necessarily think that fish always take it for that. I think it just looks impressionistic. And to me, that's the most important thing. I can throw this now under pressure. Should have had this ready. Hey, this is why you guys were telling me to slow down. I had all my stuff set up. I knew what I was doing. You guys did not, so get a taste of my own medicine here. You guys can get ahead. Jeez. I don't like that bottom. All right, so now that I got my bottom thread. So this is extremely simple, all right? Stupid simple, stupid, stupid simple. So this is our, I just call this simply the rib. Um, if you fish with me ever, or if you've ever seen me tie at the shop, you know that I tie just tons of these um, I just tie just a base of thread. And I'm going to use the same V rig, but I'm going to use it in the midge size since I went down to a 16. And once again, I'm going to make sure that flat portion of this is facing the fly and the curved side is up. It's so a lot harder to feel and see on this smaller size. So I'm gonna put it up to the light here for myself. Kind of getting dark outside. I had some natural light come in here at the start of this session and that's very much gone away. So I'm gonna to have to get in your way for a second as I feel this. All right. So I make sure that my curved side is facing up. Like I said, pretty hard to do with this little stuff, especially because my light quality kind of decreased as we went on. But I'm just gonna tie this in. Make a nice base of that chartreuse so that it shows through. Because as I wrap this V-rib, I want that to have a nice even layer so it kind of looks gives you that same effect the whole way around so i'm going to wrap it around 
wrap it forward just like that even the whole way I'm going to tie it off right there and that's the fly that's what I use to set up a pretty gun it's ridiculously stupid simple it's one of the fastest ties to flies that I know uh, <laughs> fastest flies to tie that I know about and it works exceptionally exceptionally well I don't have to use any UV coating it still is very durable and hard um, I just flip finish it off and I'm done. So um, instead of Pertagons, Sean, that's what I do. Um, that's not to say that Pertagons don't really, uh, that's not to say that Pertagons don't work, but that right there, that's it. That's cake. Um, so that's simple. So that's a real good, um, you know, substitute for a Pertagon if you don't have UV finish. And it gives you the same qualities. So there's my secret. Yep, Neil, I, I shared the secret. Um, it's, it's nothing, um, nothing too crazy. It just is what it is. I, I've caught just hundreds and hundreds of fish over this fly the, the last couple of years. So I, I love it. So that's, that's the secret for those of you who stayed on for the encore. There you go. So there we go. We're right at an hour. Um, that's that. Um, any questions, anybody feel free to type them in there, but thanks for joining in. It was fun. I was a little unsure, but uh, oh, the Frank gone. I like it. <laughs> we call it the V rib, but there you go. You might have just named it for me. Thanks, Lee. Lee, you're a better tired than me. I don't know why you're watching me do this. <laughs> <sighs> my dog's drinking water. He's slopping all over the place over here. I'm really happy my dogs didn't knock down my setup. I was really concerned about it because they did do that one time before we got started. So. Um, that's it guys. Um, thanks for joining in. Um, it was a lot of fun. So tune in next week. I think we got another one going. Sorry, Neil, if we don't have another one lined up and I'm lying, but hopefully we do. So, uh, thanks again, guys. Have a good night. See ya. Uh, color bead for that one. Uh, it's a gold bead for this last one. Yep. Gold bead, but don't, like I said, don't get caught up on the bead color. Um, you could use any bead. My favorite beads to use are gold, silver, and any sort of a black, like a matte black or like a like a black nickel. Um, uh, if you want to use a lot of these um, natural beads they're coming out with, like the mottled uh, uh, brown and olive, those throw those in too if you want it to look less shiny. Uh, but yep, that's that's that. So a gold bead for this one, uh, gold, silver, and and black. Those are my three. So I keep it simple. Um, simplicity works, so I stick to it. Um, Hi, Bob. So, all right, guys. Um, I'll hang out for another minute. If you have a question, feel free to pop it in. If not, have a good week. We are open in Boiling Springs now, so come on, stop on by. I think we should have almost all of the materials to tie this fly down there. Um, and also all these flies, really, to tie them down there. Um, there we're open to in-store foot traffic. Just wear your mask, do your social distancing. Um, we're back in action. Uh, we will be open Memorial Day, 10 to 3. So um, that's that. Um, hope to see you guys this weekend. I'll be in the shop Sunday and Monday. Um, have fun, guys. Have a good night. See ya.